Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to the second lecture on semantic memory. Now, in the last lecture we discussed what is semantic memory and uh, how it is arranged, uh, what are the properties of semantic memory and how long term memory is divided into both the semantic type and the episodic type. We also looked at what is stored in semantic memory, uh, the kind of information, facts, uh, knowledges, arithmetic rules, uh, certain kind of uh, information related to everyday world activities, everyday world knowledges all are stored in semantic memory and so there is uh, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of memory which stores most kind of information that people use in everyday life. Uh, we then discussed a distinction between the episodic semantic memory and we looked at uh, what is the main differences and so some of the main differences I will repeat here is that episodic memory uh, is basically time dependent or temporarily arranged whereas, semantic memory is arranged according to meaning which basically means that as you un as a episodic memory unfolds it unfolds in time you can see yourself in time whereas, if an semantic memory unfolds it unfolds as a meaning. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, the meaning of this is that when you unfold an episodic memory uh, like let us say uh, your uh, uh, prom night or maybe your uh, graduation night. So, every event is arranged in terms of time from morning to afternoon to evening what happened during the whole day. Whereas, if you ask questions like if you think about uh, uh, acts like arithmetic rule of how addition subtraction progresses, you really do not need to um, uh, know the time of the day when you learned or how they progressed in terms of time. The other differentiation between uh, episodic and semantic memory is in episodic memory it is when so remembering when it, the incident happened, but in terms of semantic memory it is more about what happened. So, what is the content of it and so this is one distinction between episodic and semantic memory and so is, uh, is the focus of the memory. So, episodic memory the focus is the self. So, everything uh, arranged in, in episodic memory is around self you as a person uh, can see everything going around and you can watch this thing as a third person uh, observer. But in semantic memory that is not possible what really happens is that you get gather information and you are not the self uh, the self is not the center stage of this memory, but rather the world knowledge is the center stage. So, knowledge is basically what comes out of semantic memory. So, this is something that we saw in the last class. Now, we also saw two models of memory semantic memory that in the last class one model was called the hierarchical semantic network model where we looked at how semantic memory arranges concepts and uh, a, a world information and we saw that it arranges the world information in terms of nodes. So, there are several nodes and so uh, nodes are basically concepts and these nodes two nodes which are similar together or even if they are dissimilar they are connected by a pointer or a link between them. And so, these pointer node kind of a thing uh, which is very similar to programming in C is what happens in the hierarchical semantic model. We also looks at, uh, looked at some of the uh, basic uh, in interesting facts about uh, cement, uh, the hierarchical uh, semantic model. And we also looked at a criticism of how uh, it does not follow the cognitive economy on how the uh, concept of hierarchical structure is basically violated. So, uh, that kind of thing is what we saw in the last class. We also saw uh, the feature 
integration model or the feature model of semantic memory, we, we saw that there are uh, two kinds of features. So, most information is arranged in terms of features and so, there are two basic kinds of uh, features that is available with any word concept or knowledge and so, one of these is called the defining feature, the other is called the uh, characteristic feature. We also saw a model of how these features are tested. So, that is another interesting thing that, that has to be there. So, what really happens is that uh, in the beginning to start with the feature model takes off in this way. Uh, the first at first uh, we start comparing the characteristic features and if uh, the characteristic feature of two objects or a characteristic feature of a new event is similar to a proposed concept. Uh, the more similarity it is, the quicker a person decides the newer instance to be a part of uh, the concept. If the feature is very low, we can go ahead and say that this particular new concept which is in front of us, this particular new item which is in front of us is not a member of the concept and so we can delete this thing. Now, if the characteristic feature is neither very high nor very low. So, we proceed to uh, combining or testing the defining features and so, when we looked at the defining features, this is the next step. The uh, uh, in this case only the defining. So, if characteristic features are neither high uh, nor very low or the defining features are tested and when the defining features uh, we get a match of the number of defining features a uh, yes answer comes in then the new item or the new enterant is basically uh, matched to uh, the concept and a yes signal is given or if uh, the defining features uh, number of defining features are very low in the new item as compared to the concept it a new uh, a no signal is uh, out outputted and basically it is rejected that the item belongs to this concept. And so, this is how the idea of feature integration model really works. We also looked at some of the interesting things about the feature integration model. For example, uh, how it progresses and what are the uh, uh, how it solves the hierarchy problem or uh, it uh, goes ahead and solves uh, ca ca category problem. So, what it basically says is as category increases more and more abstraction comes in and so, with the increase in category the uh, thus uh, or increase in the size of the category, this process of similarity matching becomes more and more difficult. Now, in today's class we will look at some of the um, uh, newer models which are there, some of the uh, more models which are there and then further on we will look into something called how uh, beside the model, the concept of model, how is semantic memory supposed to uh, store information. So, we will start with uh, model proposed by uh, Collins and Loftus in 1975 and so Collins and Loftus they basically went, uh, went ahead and they proposed a model which is very similar to the hierarchical semantic model. And so, what uh, the basic of this model is it is an elaboration of Collins and Quillen's 1969 model as I said it is an in, uh, extension of the original model proposed by Collins and Quillen. And so, basically this model also states that semantic information or world knowledge is basically uh, integrated together or the world knowledge is stored into the semantic network in terms of nodes, where nodes is the concept and pointers, the pointers are the links between these concepts. So, hierarchical model uh, the only change that this model brings about is that in this model the concept of spreading activation is, um, a, uh, is the center point or is the central feature of this model. So, then what does this model uh, be, uh, basically say? The model conceives of semantic memory as a network with nodes in the network corresponding, uh, uh, network corresponding to concepts. So, what this model says is that the semantic memory or semantic information world information is arranged in terms of a node or in a network of nodes. And so, uh, in, in this network the nodes which we are talking about the central point from which communication occurs these are called the nodes, the nodes are the concepts and basically the nodes uh, the uh, which stores the basic features of the concepts or the, uh, uh, the nodes are always the sub superordinate con uh, superordinate nodes. So, concept storing nodes are always the superordinate uh, uh, nodes. Also, they saw related concepts is related by connected in paths of the network. So, if two concepts are related together, they are connected by uh, some kind of a pointer or some kind of a link and this link 
is uh, basically called the pointer. Now, the more similar two nodes are, the more similar two concepts are, the higher the weight between these uh, uh, links. So, basically if two concepts are similar, they the, the path running between these concepts or the pointer running between these concepts will have a higher weight than if two, two concepts are connected which have very dissimilar uh, properties or very di dissimilar uh, uh, features. Now, how do we think about this? So, for example, let us think about fire and uh, uh, sunset. Now, both fire and sunset they are uh, not connected together, they should not be connected together because fire relates to um, uh, some other concept, uh, some other um, uh, network and sunset is related to another network. But then there is one feature of fire and sunset which are similar and that is the color red. So, one relation between fire and uh, the sunset is red, but then since they are not related together, the pointer running between fire and sunset should have a lesser weight. But then if I am talking about bread and butter, although or king and queen, when I am talking about king and queen, these two uh, uh, nodes or these two con uh, items in, in a particular uh, network are originating from two different network, but since king and queen are connected by also through a intermediary network or intermediary pointer. And so, each time when I say king a queen really comes in or uh, the ans uh, the in a paired associate testing the queen is the answer to king most of the time. So, if you ask people king and then ask them to say the first word that comes to the mind that is queen is the what the uh, comes in then what really happens is these two concepts are connected by a pointer which has very high weight. Similarly, pointers connecting bread and butter or pointers connecting between shoe and shoelaces are very high uh, weights than pointers which are dissimilar, pointers connecting uh, uh, a desk and an aeroplane. So, the, although they would be related or they will be feebly related, but the pointer which connects these these two uh, nodes or these two items will be very weakly related and so that is what uh, this model uh, says. They first further asserted that, so in this particular model it was further said that when one, one mode is uh, uh, activated, the excitation of the node spreads down a path or links of ex, uh, related nodes. So, what happens it is similar to the concept of spreading activation and so what taking back from the idea of spreading activation, what this concept says is that as soon as a node is activated, if soon as there is some energy is provided to a node, this energy spreads down through not only through this node, but all connected nodes, all connected links. So, if I am activating the animal node, what would happen is the energy will spread down to all kind of animals which are there. It could be birds, it could be mammals, it could be uh, reptiles, it could be all kind of animals. And so, from there it will further uh, process down or it will spread down to other uh, within any uh, within mammals it will spread down to all kind of mammals which are there. So, it may, may be lion, tiger and so on and so forth. In terms of reptiles it will uh, spread down to snakes, uh, to uh, alligators and to so on and so forth. In terms of birds it will spread down to different kind of birds whether it is a feathered bird, non feathered bird and so on and so forth. So, basically this is how the, uh, uh, the idea is what this model says is that when an energy is provided to a particular node, this energy spreads down through all connected and all uh, linked nodes. Now, they this uh, particular theory is or this theorist, they believe that as activation, activation spreads down the path or links to a related node. So, the activation spreads outwardly and decreases in strength, it basically what it means is that as the node as the energy it moves down a node what happens is this energy since it channelized it gets channelized into so many other nodes the energy becomes decreased in strength. So, if two nodes are far apart if two connecting items or two connecting nodes are far apart from each other in terms of a number of pointers or fourth or fifth or sixth level relation and the, on the sixth level relation the energy which starts from the top of the node will be very very decrease. So, when activation spreads outward it decreases in strength and as I said that both aeroplane and desk are related, but they are weakly related because the energy which is uh, activated when I say or when I activate the concept of an aeroplane or any flying object should be the highest concept with the under which aeroplane would fall. So, when that is activated although desk will 
be activated in some way, but the energy spread will be very low, because somehow somewhere they will be related, but since they are so further out related the weights are very low and the energy that reaches to desk from an aeroplane will be very, very low. Uh, and so, what they I also say is that uh, uh, activating related concepts uh, uh, when an activation starts, when the spreading activation, when any activation or when any node is energized, it activates very related concepts with, uh, with high uh, amount of energies and uh, distant concepts are uh, or distant nodes are activated with less energy and that is what is supposed to be right. So, nodes which are related together or semantically or perceptually or any kind of relations are there between nodes they would be very closer together and so when energy when uh, particular node when the top node is energized then similar nodes since they are very close to each other they will receive maximum energy. But those nodes which are further apart or which are very dissimilar to the particular node in question then the energy which is which is uh, which is coming to these nodes will be very less or it will be very low so think of this in uh, this way so let's say that we have a node of animal and so within animal or let's say i have a node of uh, living things so i have a top order node of living things. And so, within living things I will have two or nodes which are animals and plants. And within animals let us say I will just put two categories I will have uh, mammals and birds and within plants I will have um, trees and shrubs. And so, within mammals I will further have let us say uh, lion tiger is one category and the other mammal is <coughs> uh, monkey orangutan within birds I will have the feathered birds. So, I will have something like a parrot and I will have a non feathered bird. So, I will have something like an ostrich and uh, within this also. So, uh, within trees I will have an apple tree or I will have a pine tree and shrub similarly as I let us suppose I have A and B as. Now, what does this model explain and how does this model go ahead and explain. So, let us say if living thing is the node and these are the pointers to the node. So, remember these are the nodes and this is the pointer which shows the spread of energy. So, what it says is when any node is activated energy spreads down equally to these nodes. Right. And so, when a node let us say if a node lion is activated now somewhere across this lion will be related to this apple tree or this tree right. Some kind of connections would be there. So, lion lives in forest and forest has trees and so they will be connected somehow or the other. But what this model particular says is that when this is energized and if lion is the node which is energized and this is how the energy is moving. then concepts which are closely related together for example, lion, mammal, animal and living things they will have a stronger connection, stronger weight and so more energy will be spread here or more of them uh, energy is uh, invested into this node than for the plants. Although plants are living things, but since the lion node is energized and so energy will be spread to these nodes. So, birds will receive lesser energy similarly the monkey will receive lesser energy similarly feathered and non feathered birds will receive less energy also uh, no question of energy distribution here or very less energy distribution here, but the most energy distribution will be to the uh, node lion, mammal, animal and living things. And this is what this model says. So, if first of all energy spreads it moves down and as it moves down it spreads out. So, energy will be basically moving to all directions right and so here the less lesser energy is, is in invested in these parts than in this part and this is what the uh, basic proposition of this model is. And so as I was talking about so this is how uh, the model looks like. So, if this is the animal node, this is the bird node, this is uh, the chicken node and so within the bird node you have the chicken node and so you look into it. So, uh, let us say if feet or if robin is activated then this particular node will be energized and so high energy will be or more energy is spent into this node 
then the nodes with chicken or the nodes with eye feathers and so these are also nodes these are also certain nodes which are there which are connected to pointer so these nodes will not receive an uh, enough sufficient energy but these 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 nodes will receive sufficient energy and so will these nodes because they are connected to robin also these nodes which are there legs breathe eyes ears and so, so on and so forth will not be receiving energy and so that is what the model talks about and this is a way of it. So, basically this model is just an extension of the hierarchical symmetric model. The only difference is that it talks about this threading activation of how energy spreads when it starts uh, when it is activated at the top and how it filters down or it how it moves down from there. So, in this model uh, the idea is that very similar concepts have uh, many connecting links and are placed close to each other. So, what this model says is that similar concepts, concepts which share certain features, certain distinctive features with each other, they are placed together or they are uh, blocked in some kind of a uh, block which are which have very close proximity with each other, right. Now, or each link and connection between two concepts is thought to have a certain weight or set of weights and now uh, as I was explaining now since two concepts are related to each other or they are placed in close proximity to each other these links will have very higher weight. So, as as two links the more similar two links are the more similar two nodes are the stronger the weight between them and the more energy or more energized they will become then two nodes which are dissimilar with each other. Now, the criticism to this model, the criticism is that the model is the breadth of the model. The breadth of the model is so huge that it is difficult to make clear and strong predictions from the model regarding empirical findings. So, the model is so huge, it talks about that everything is connected to everything and there is there is this weight, the idea of weight and the idea of how it is connected to each other. And another problem with this model is what makes two concepts similar. So, this similarity concept or this uh, idea of similarity has not been explained by this model and so it is a difficulty, it is a genuine difficulty with this model of how uh, do we encompass or how do we study this similarity that we are talking about, what do we call similarity. So, are we talking about the defining features, are we talking about uh, the characteristic features, what makes similarity similar and so this is one thing or one problem with this model. And so, in opposition to this model not exactly direct opposition to this model another interesting model was proposed uh, for semantic memory and this is called the Anderson's ACT or ACTR model. So, what is this model? It was proposed by John Anderson in 1976 and it is called the adaptive control of thought model of memory. It is also known as ACT, ACT star, ACTR and so on and so forth. So, uh, those of you who do modeling or who do uh, computational modeling will be very familiar with the ACTR structure, the adaptive control of thought. Now, that uh, uh, so, basically what is it is a process model, it is a process orientation model and so this process orientation model basically it is uh, kind of a box pointer model. Remember the first class that we did, we talked about two kinds of model, the box and pointer model and we also talked about the connectivist model where we have a uh, unit uh, input link and output link and a and uh, mm, hidden link. So, the next model that we talk about the connectivist model is basically at that time. Now, this is a box and pointer model and so what does this uh, model say? So, based on analogies to computers ACT gives rise to several computer simulations of cognitive processing in different tasks. So, basically this model has certain conceptualizations of how information in is stored in our memory basically world information or common sense information with implicit knowledge is stored in our memory. So, what are these conceptualizations that this model says? Now, the first conceptualization that this model talks about is that it distinguishes between the three type of memory systems. It says that the human memory system is basically arranged in three different types or three different ways of looking into it. It is arranged in terms of declarative memories. Now, declarative memories is that memory which will have more uh, all information, facts, knowledge, arithmetic rule, world knowledge, everything into it. And so, there is no distinction of the episodic and the semantic here. And so, this model looks at declarative memory is the storehouse of all kinds of information, whether it is personal information, whether it is self related information or event related information or fact related information. And so, the first conceptualization of this model is that there is something called declarative memory and this declarative memory has all kinds of 
information that should be present or that is present in this world. Also, there is a conceptualization of working memory which is information that is currently at the highest level of activation. So, it uh, talks about working memory or uh, working memory is that kind of memory according to ACTR or adaptive control of thought model which we are using right now. So, although declarative memory stores a lot of information, it has a lot of information and so I will explain to you the how this declarative memory really works. So, basically declarative memory is conceived as a model with nodes the similar to the hierarchical semantic model and so there are nodes and these nodes are connected by weights and these weights are de determined by the strength of the pointer or the similarity between two nodes. So, basically that is how declarative memory is stored, but declarative memory cannot on its own do anything and so there is a conceptualization of working memory, working memory is that part of memory or that kind of memory which is active at any point of time. So, when I am accessing declarative memory, the kind of memory which is accessing and doing all, quarter, all operations onto declarative memory is called the working memory. It is memory at the highest level. So, information access and information uh, processing are all, all those operations which are doing the information processing and accessing memory from declarative store is basically what is called the working memory. So, think of working memory is a part of declarative memory, but it is that part which is active which is doing the processing or which is running the operations or the rules of the game which uh, which it is running is what is the working memory. And next to it is the idea of procedural memory. So, procedural memory is a kind of memory which is procedure based but and it, it, it works on to uh, or it works something like in terms of production rules. So, there are certain production rules, we will come to explain that also. So, there are certain production rules, there are certain ways of doing things and the procedural memory is basically uh, a kind of memory which follow these rules and does a particular kind of an act right. So, basically then this memory talks about declarative memory in this way. So, Anderson 83 believe that declarative memory stores information in network that contain nodes as I said before what declarative memory generally tends to do it has a large vast network and these networks has concepts which are stored as nodes and so all concepts which have similar features or similarity based kind of matching is there. So, those concepts which are similar are clubbed together and these have the highest weight and they the weight is basically the strength of how close two concepts are. And so, these have higher weights and they are connected by some kind of a pointer. So, this is how declarative uh, memory is all about. Now, there are different type of nodes including those corresponding to spatial images and abstract propositions. So, basically instead of the conceptualization of working memory by Alan Bradley where he thinks about there is some something called the uh, visual spatial sketch pad and phonological loop. Anderson's model talks about declarative memory as network of nodes and these nodes are of two specialized vari variation. One is spatial image, so space related information and because this model is a conceptualization of a, a, a computer program. So, it has to define spaces and so that one way of looking into declarative memory is space information or space images. Basically, what in, in a problem space, how does somebody move? So, you should have to, you should have to know the boundaries of the space and the kind of uh, uh, problems in a space and that is why the idea of special image or space image is there. So, nodes in declarative memory are of two types either it is space related nodes which tell you the boundaries uh, or the kind of problems or the kind of um, uh, hindrances that you get while sol solving a problem and so that is past space relation information or you have uh, abstract propositions. So, abstract propositions are basically how things are related to another, what is the proposition or what is the kind of rule which relates to information together. So, basically ab ab abstract propositions are how two rules are related to each other because these rules will define how a particular information is accessed. So, a rule A and rule B how they are related to, to uh, together for example, let us look at simple rules. So, if, if A uh, if A infers B and B infers C, which not, not necessarily means that C infers A. So, this backward propagation is not there and so similarly, these kind of rules of what relates to what or kind of uh, uh, it is part of a set theory. So, how these rules are there, how these propositions really work is what is stored in a particular node. Now, also ACT model allows for both activation of any node and for spreading activation of concepts. So, it, it basically encompasses or it basically includes activation of node and spreading activation to be true. So, if any node is active, the node will pass this activation onto related nodes 
uh, and non related nodes uh, together, but related nodes will have high energy and non related nodes will have lower energy and that that is why it also agrees with the idea of uh, excitation passing over to nodes and the idea of what spreading activation is all about. Further this concept uh, the ACTR the adaptive control of thought it talks about procedural memory. So, what is procedural memory? It says representation of a series of production rules. So, basically uh, uh, the procedural memory works in this way that there are certain production rules of how an act should be done. Now, these production rules generally have a goal it has a starting a goal and certain kind of conditions a certain kind of rules to be followed. So, basically it goes in this way that if you start somewhere now this start and then there is a goal state. So, so reaching to the goal state are, uh, are basically within the goal state and the start state are certain hindrances and certain rules that you have to follow. And if you follow these rules and overcome these hindrances you will reach the goal states. Let us try and uh, explain to you what this really means. So, let us say that uh, it is a festival which is going on and so uh, just near where you live in your hostel rooms or wherever you live the <coughs> the place near that everybody is singing in a very good mood but then you know that there is an exam right so uh, the idea is that tomorrow you have an exam you are living where you are living and just beside the window of where you are studying in your home lies or in your hostel lies a program where people are shouting and marrying together or they are making merry. Now, the thing is that the goal is to pass the exam with good marks. The starting point is the position where you uh, where you are sitting right now and then there are rules and there are hindrances to it. The hindrances is if you are there then basically uh, uh, there will be so much sound that you cannot uh, read and the certain and the rules are that you should not disturb them. So, you have to follow a rule. The rule is um, that certain rules have to be followed. So, uh, basically you uh, if there is a lot of people. So, you cannot stop them by rule they are free to do whatever they are uh, to do, but the rule also says that there are certain possibilities which are here the production rule says that there are certain possibilities here. For example, one part one solution to this problem is going to the library, but it also has a rule that the library starts at 9 p m. So, wait for 9 p m then follow the rule of the library where by rule of the library no one can shout there. So, even if people want they, may, they cannot shout there. And so, one way to, uh, to reach your uh, goal is to and to uh, uh, get out or get away from these hindrances is pack your bag after 9 p m, go to the library, study there till the rule permits, come back and pass the exam nicely. So, this way you have enjoyed till 9 p m whatever is happening after 9 p m move out of there, follow certain rules. Uh, um, uh, get rid of certain obstacles, go to the library which is a solution to it and then pass the exam. And the, so, this is basically achieving the goal state following certain rules and certain hindrances. So, basically these production rules or this procedural memory generally is a if then statement which tells how to perform a particular action. So, if this happens then this is the kind of thing which is there that kind of a thing. So, if, if you uh, want to study for your exam together. Uh, uh, for yes, uh, for tomorrow, then you have to find a place which is uh, uh, silent. If you have to find a place which is silent, then you have to do this. And so there are certain rules, hindrances, goals, and four-part system which is there. We'll talk about this into problem solving into when we come to the section of problem solving. Also, production rules specify a goals to achieve one or more conditions that has to be true for the rule to apply and one or more actions that result by applying the rule. So, as the, I explained to you there is a goal to be achieved there are certain conditions should, that should be fulfilled for example, if you go to the library that will be silent and the rule says that it has to be silent and so you have to uh, go there and then these are the conditions preconditions and one or more action the action is getting your books going to the library studying there and then coming back and so this is how the uh, conceptualization of working memory or the idea of ACTR really uh, talks about in terms of procedural memory. So, basically in terms of ACTR it is about three memory systems which interact with each other and they lead to the formation or storing of uh, memory data into uh, the human uh, brain. Now, basically then this is how a simple ACTR model will work and so you as you see this is the declarative memory. So, you have both the motor module and the visual module. 
So, two modules are there and these collect information from the environment the motor module con contains special information the visual module contains those proposition abstract pro propositions which are there and combined to something called the ACTR buffers. The ACTR buffers then also gathers information from procedural memory because the procedural memory will tell you how to exactly go about the uh, procedure of doing certain things. So, basically how to go about the storing things. So, declarative memory is these two parts are the declarative memory and this information comes to ACTI buffer. The ACTR buffer then talks to procedural memory which tells you the procedures which tells you what is to be done and so the two procedures are pattern matching and products execution and based on that you will come to again to the ACTR. So, this is the input and this is the output and the output is again fed to the input and this kind of a chain goes on and on. So, basically any module or any kind of information which which comes here is processed through this kind of a thing and this here it is a simple visual task matching program that I have designed. And so, as you can see this is how this model really works the ACTR model really works. Now, in addition to the ACTR model uh, interesting another model which has been proposed is called the connectivist model. Now, what is this model? It is a very interesting model and this model does not conceptualize uh, the way the we thought about how things are stored either as networks or memories or in terms of concepts or in terms of knowledge network of knowledge or in terms of three kinds of memories. They do not conceptualize this in this way. So, what connectivist model think about is that what is stored they say that what is stored in uh, the memory or what is stored as world knowledge is basically a set of changes in the instruction of neurons uh, which send to each other affecting the pattern of activity that can be constructed from a given input. What does it really mean? It says that what is stored first of all it is it is kind of a copy from the biological model. So, as as we saw in one of these classes I explained to you how memory is stored is memory is stored as interconnections between neurons. And so, what really happens is memory is basically a connection or it is basically a, a path from one neuron to the other neuron. And so, what this model says is that what is stored between two neurons is not knowledge or concepts. What is stored in the memory is not knowledge or concepts. It is set of instructions which are stored and which is passed on from one neuron to the another. What are these instructions? These instructions tell a particular set of neuron which are connected to each other to process how to process data. And so, there are certain modes of processing and so, these instructions basically ask neurons or basically instruct neurons in processing. So, let us look at I will briefly de define this model this is a very huge and complex model. So, I will try and very briefly define this model for you. So, basically this model learns to develop patterns of activation through many trials with training examples for or example uh, back propagation. So, basically how this model links is or how this model really works is there are certain input layer there are certain input features or input units. Now, a unit ha has uh, uh, is, is a pattern is a, a unit is thought about as item which receives input from the environment. And so, this unit then passes this information on to a hidden layer or hidden unit or a hidden related uh, set of units which are there. For example, verifying robin is a bird if it is a very simple statement robin is a bird the robin as soon as the robin unit is activated it will unit uh, it will activate all related units with the bird with it right. So, uh, uh, things like bird has legs, bird has feathers, bird has beaks, bird has a different color and so on and so forth. So, all these uh, units will get activated. Now, how does this model really work? So, it has an input unit and this in input unit where they get an input some of this uh, hidden and there, there is a lot of hidden layer there is a lot of in hidden input which is there. And so, what happens is the strength of activation or there is a number of uh, uh, inputs which are there let us look into this model first of all. So, basically this is the connectivist model of a robin and so, this is a lot of inputs which is coming from the environment. So, when you see robin for example, this is the bird that you are seeing and so, only when robin is activated all these things which are coming from the environment is deactivated at that point of time only the robin mode is activated and this robin mode now then connects to this hidden layer. So, robin is 
So, basically if I am activating the word robin, robin is basically a bird and so basically is is and has this is basically the kind of uh, um, uh, connector to robin which can get activated. Basically robin is a bird, robin can be a bird, robin has a bird all kind of connectors are there and so robin is is activated or can is activated and so these activations further link to this um, hidden model or this hidden layer and this hidden layer then basically gets trained and then from there the uh, thing is now robin is a particular name and can is also a particular name. So, what can robin do? Robin basically can be both a bird and a person right and so when I see a robin in the environment the uh, node which is activated is robin if I am saying this is activated and robin can. So, what can robin do? If it is a man, if it is a human thing it can do these many things, but if it is uh, robin can also be an abstract thing and so with, when it is an abstract thing it can have several other features with it, but when it is a bird then it can do all these things it these nodes are activated because the bird can grow, the bird can move, the bird cannot swim and so this is not activated. The bird cannot sing, so it is not activated maybe it should activate the bird cannot bark and so this is not activated, the bird does not have branches and so it is not activated. So, when a set of input node is activated, these input nodes has a number of connecting nodes with it right. So, when, when I look let us assume an example where I look outside of my window and when I see several things. I put my attention onto robin. Now, this robin has a bird is a bird and so there are certain features of robin which has to be activated and so basically this model then says that if robin is activated similarly will be activated the word can robin can and robin can do what. So, you see a robin or you see a bird which is on the on on uh, on where your attention is followed, but there are several other things which are there. So, there will be several other nodes which can get activated, but your attention is focused on to only robin and so what robin can do is it can grow, it can move, it can fly and these three things are the only one which should be activated. Bird could also be activated, but then other things are related to all other things that you have seen in the outside environmental world and so basically it will not get activated. Now, how does this model really works? So, this model says is that the input layer basically it learns. So, when an input layer is activated it activates related layers with it related hidden layers with it and so it uh, at the beginning of any uh, input cycle. Uh, the strength between the input node and the hidden node will be random weights. Let us say if 0 and 1 are the two allowable weights which uh, the in input layer and the hidden uh, layer would have at the beginning of any propagation or the beginning of any inputs uh, 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 signal the weights between the uh, hidden layer and the input layer would be a 0 0.5. Now, as as I said there are number of factors or the number of items which compete with each other to start the input and since robin has started the input it will change its weight right. So, so the weight of robin will become 0 0.8 from 0 0.5 it will become 0 0.8, but all other weights for example, uh, tree, house all other things which have been captured at the same moment, but attention has not been put to the weights of these will change slowly change to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.15 or so on and so forth. Only the robin node is activated and so the weight of this will increase, it will increase to one, uh, 0 0.8 and so the and a hidden layer will learn this. Now, hidden layer will also get some information both from the perceptual system as well as from the memory system because robin is activated. So, the memory system will also feed in some information and so for example, robin can, robin has, robin kind of a thing. So, it is present tense and so can would be activated and so can will have a higher weight it will the weights will change to 0 0.8 and similarly there are certain features of what robin can do. Now, robin can fly, robin can um, uh, has a beak, it, it can do this, it can do uh, sing, it can have color and all those things will be activated and all other weights will not be activated. Now, basically this model then what it does is from an input it generates an output and with that input output system it starts learning right and so where how it what is the meaning of learning each time a particular input is selected and output is generated the connection becomes stronger and stronger. More stronger the connection the more faster the learning and so this kind of model basically is a learning model. So, let us look at what this is and so this how do we train this model. So, first you show the model that robin 
is whatever it is. So, any bird you show the model any bird it can do these things and this can basically result in this kind of a feature. And so, it is a training example from that training example show it the model uh, a bird. Now, you have started with the idea of bird. So, from robin change it to parrot and let us see how the model behaves. Now, parrot is very similar to robin. So, as soon as it identifies that it is closer to the concept robin. So, it will then adjust the bait between it and the when the, the in input system and the hidden system as 0 0.8. It will learn this and similarly output all the features that it is output for the concept a bird and it uh, goes on doing this and so uh, after training after training or time after time it will then develop that this is the feature of what should be of a bird. So, next time you present it a bird that it does not know which is not a training example it quickly classifies this as a bird and then outputs a list of features that the bird is going to happen. So, initially connections between nodes are set as, as I said it is set, set at random weights experience leads these connections to be activated more and less strongly. So, the more closely each time when it produces an output this output is compared to a uh, set of uh, truth features. Uh, this output is connected uh, is basically uh, matched to what should be uh, what should be expected as an output and the closer the match the better the training. So, if it is not closer then the model, model adjusts the weights accordingly and de either deletes some of the features or increases some of the features and this goes on making the weights or goes on making the number of connections. So, training occurs by presenting a specific example to the network which then generates a particular output. So, so you start with uh, let us say parrot and you teach the model that if parrot occurs, if parrot comes in these are the features you need to output. Next time you start the training with say a sparrow this is what it is. So, slowly the mo model or slowly the input layer will understand that ok once something like this is presented something like a bird is presented because it gathers those features then these are the nodes which have to be activated. And so, the nodes which have to be activated then gathers a higher weight and then output which it which it should present. So, also tell it the output. So, when I show a parrot show me the output that it can fly, it can wing, it has wings, it can do this, it can do that, that kind of a thing and also show me the ways for things it cannot do and so match it with this idea that parrots can fly. So, this is a verified sentence and this is a true sentence. So, verify with that. Now, next uh, after so many trials after say uh, uh, 50 or 100 trials when you show it uh, uh, may be a, a different kind of bird for example, let us say a uh, crow and what does the model do when you show it a crow although you do not tell the model this is a crow the model adjusts the weights accordingly and says that it has a beak it can fly and so on and so forth because these are the proning programs. So, you train it with some examples and then the model learns on its own and starts adjusting the weight. So, it will also give you with the crow it will also give you inputs outputs like it is black in color, it has two eyes, beaks these are the generic things, but certain other features also it will tell you. Also training plays in epochs. So, basically these training they go about in epochs and each epoch produces an output activation which is compared to a correct target activation. This is how this model really works and as I said these are number of things are these are, these are number of input systems which are activated only robin is activated and so what will happen is only these connections are energized and all connections have starts having lower weights and so since this feature is related to this feature so these features add on to this model and so only a b c as you can see is activated here and others are not and so when it gets training the in the next training round on the next epoch it will also learn that it is a bird it will also learn that it is red or green in color it is also learn that it it, it, it it has wings and feathers and so on and so forth and so more number of outputs will be activated. So, it is not only uh, that through these models we can explain semantic memory there are two more concepts through which we can understand how semantic knowledge or world knowledge is arranged. And so, two of these concepts uh, one of the famous con uh, ways of ex doing that is what was proposed by Sir Frederick Bartlett. And so, what Bartlett did was he did a very interesting study and he showed that there is a lot of reconstruction in memory and this reconstruction is how. So, what he says is that what semantic memory uh, stores is not an exact representation of what happens, but a gist a kind of a uh, broken down version of the information that is what is stored in our memory. And so, he's, uh, in his uh, experiments he presented something called a war of ghost a story to one a couple of people. And 
the story was a complex story it had many relations and many kind of information into it they were so interpieced and they were so uh, closer to each other that it was very difficult to uh, break the story apart and so this story was presented to a number of people and when these people who were presented they were asked to recall the story after a certain period of time back what really happened is that most of the people remember the gist of the story, the main idea of the story, but they forgot the uh, basic uh, uh, features or, or the basic some basic uh, things about the story. For example, names, places, these were mixed up, but the story, the outline of the story was what was there. And so, Frederick Bartlett says that there is a way of storing uh, uh, these kind of information or general world knowledge information and that is what a schema is. So, then look at what is a schema. So, basically schema represents knowledge in the semantic memory and that is what Bartlett's proposition is. There is something called a schema. So, what is a schema then? A schema contains general knowledge about the world and information about particular event. So, it is not only con consisting of general knowledge about worlds, but it also has information about particular events. So, it has both declarative as well as schematic uh, uh, semantic type of information onto it. Now, schemas are large units of organized information which are used for representing concepts, situations, uh, events, actions in memory. So, basically a schema is kind of a huge, it is a huge uh, uh, box kind of a thing where a lot of information could be presented into or could be put into and these information when they are put into they uh, sort of act together or they sort of uh, uh, work together. For example, Rommel Hart and uh, Ortney in 77, they proposed that the fundamental building block of cognition is this schema. So, this schema has information stored into it in kinds of world knowledge is kind of a guideline of what should happen. A schema is kind of a guideline of what to be expected. For example, the schema of uh, let us say a, um, a village. Now, the schema of a village basically says that these things for example, uh, bullocks, fields, uh, green fields, water bodies, uh, people, farmers, trees, uh, animals, this is what should ex ex uh, you expect in a village. You sh uh, should not or you cannot expect a car or modern bu building or uh, an aeroplane in a village. And so, these are the kind of things which is expected with the kind which is not expected. And the schema of a village will have this kind of an information. So, basically then schemas are big, uh, packets of information that contains both a variable and a uh, uh, fixed part. For example, if you look at the schema of a dog, the fixed part of, of this information is that it has mammals and four legs because the fixed part is sad across all instances of the schema. So, any dog you look into it, it will be a mammal and it will have four legs, but then most schemas also have a variable part and the variable part is where we where this feature they change across instances or change across variations of the schema. And so, uh, things like breed, things like size, color, temperament, these might change across dogs. So, you might have an Alsatian, you might have a Pomeranian, you might have a uh, Saint Bernard or you can have any kind of dog which is there. You could have a very light tempered dog, a heavy tempered dog, a highly colored dog, a non colored dog, a chihuahua kind of a thing which has a very strange kind of a thing, sizes. So, as I said, you could have a uh, Great Dane which is very high in size, you can have a chihuahua which looks like more like a cat and so on and so forth. So, within dog variations could be there, but then the fixed part is that all dogs have or all dogs within that particular category or that says schema should be same. Also, schema indicate relationship among various parts of information. Now, what, what do I mean by this? Uh, if I am talking about a dog, now the idea is that the dog should have a head and this head should have two eyes only. The tail should not be coming out of the head and or the nose. So, basically there are certain relations which are there among certain parts of the dog and that is what it is. So, the rear of the dog should have the tail and the forward of the dog should have uh, eyes and the color of the dog should be in this variation. The hind leg should be here, the fore leg should be here. This kind of interpretation should be there. So, schema indicates the relationship among the various pieces of information should be there. What is the fixed piece and what is the variable? piece and what is the relation to each other. So, a dog which has uh, 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 legs coming out of the eyes is not actually a dog an instance of a dog, but a dog which has eyes coming out of the head is basically a kind of a dog and so this is the relationship and so the leg should be below the eyes and so on and so forth. Also, schemata connects to other schemata in a varieties of ways. So, not just one schema, a number of schemas can be connected to each other. One schema of particular thing can also be connected to another schema of some other things. 
Now, schema is also used for filling in default values of certain aspects of a situation which help us in making an assumption. So, basically the schema tells us as, as I said the schema tells us what is to be done in a particular situation. So, let us say if uh, you are in uh, in uh, in an exam hall the schema says that or if I am telling you a story of uh, how I met my roommate school class roommate for the first time. I do not need to tell you that what is my age because most people turn to school around 18, 19 years in a graduation school around 18, 19 years. So, this can be auto filled that this is what your age should be and so when I am talking when I am referring to a friend as her you do, I do not need to tell the gender of this field. So, this can be auto filled a schema will provide this kind of a thing. So, when I am talking about a gender I am talking about that my roommate is a her then the idea that this is a female is automatically comes in. Also schema exist in all levels of abstraction uh, thus they can exist for small parts of knowledge also. So, basically what it means is that schemas can be for very small uh, knowledge abstractions for example, uh, certain letters written in certain kind of ink letters or it could be the schema could also exist for greater details for example, like the theory of relativity. So, there are certain schemas within the theory of relativity for example, the fabric of time, the idea that time uh, dilation happens, the idea that there is something called the space time where space meets time and then this variations. So, those schemas and also very small schemas of how uh, certain letters uh, can when combined with each other give us a perception of a different letter. So, that basically at uh, that level of abstraction also schema should work. So, write A in this way and it becomes a B or B in this way you have seen those letters right calligraphies of certain kind of letters and so they also are a certain level of schema identification. Now, related to the idea of a schema is the idea of a script. Now, script are schemas for routine events for example, going to a restaurant. Now, what is a script? Think of it in this way. When you go to a restaurant there is basically a four uh, part uh, meal system right. You start with a soup or some kind of a beverage to start with then there is the first course then there is the main course then there is a sweet and then you wash your hands you pay the bill and you move away. And so basically this is what a script is. A script says how the schema moves in time how the schema moves across. So, what is the production rule for a schema or what is the procedure of a schema or what is the procedure for routine event is what a script is all about. Now, scripts are used across a variety of situations for filling out unknowns. For example, let us say that I visit a new city right. So, I visit some some uh, city I am living in some city and I am living in India and I go to the US. Now, when I go there I need not think what a restaurant should be and how should a restaurant function because I know from India that this is how a restaurant functions. So, most restaurant should function in the similar way. It is not that in those restaurants something else will happen. The same idea of what I have in India should be a capture of an incident there and so scripts certainly help us in organizing information or filling up information or uh, basically uh, how we can use it in different uh, scenarios. Uh, schemas also uh, scripts also help us in making a number of inferences. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, when I say that you have you can get a number of inferences. So, a particular uh, script when defined it shows you that what is the result of this particular thing. So, if a main course is there what is the result of this main course in a dinner? What is the result of the uh, or what follows for example. So, if I say that I, I went to the restaurant and I ate, ate my food and I came back basically you fill in in your head that you might have paid the bill and that then you came back. And so, this filling of information that you arrived at the restaurant with someone went into the restaurant sat at a place. So, when I say that I ate food in a restaurant today basically the all other ideas of you sitting in a restaurant having ordering the food eating itself is filled up and so, they this information this inferences can be made from it that you had paid the bill and come and you have not run away from the, uh, the restaurant and come out. And so, these inferences can be uh, helped. Also lastly schemas help us in making an order and so to this to test this particular thing how schema makes us th uh, things uh, uh, perceive things in an order this Bauer, Black and Turner they did a particular study. And so, in this study what they did was they presented a story and in this story the story was made in such a way that there were several concepts in the story and they were in an unordered form. So, some parts of the story uh, the 
uh, climax of the story came up before and the beginning of the story was in the somewhere in the middle and the middle of the story was somewhere in the back and that kind of information was presented to people. Now, when, re when a recall was done most people remembered the story in the right correct procedure in the right scripted order. So, although the scripts was deviated people remembered it in the right way for from how it began to what was the climax to what was the middle part to what was the climax and how it ended right. So, no matter if you intermix the kind of sequences of a story or sequences of a particular event or routine event these schemas or these scripts will basically help us reorder these things together. So, basically what we did in today's class is we looked at some other models of uh, um, uh, semantic memory or world knowledge memory into it, how do they work and what are the pitfalls of some of this model criticism of this model. We also saw the connectivist model which is a very interesting model. So, if you are looking up for taking up uh, uh, computational modeling, you can either use ACTR or connectivist model as in these models are interesting models of how they product because these models are also used for generating artificial intelligence systems or learning systems. So, basically that is what we discussed there and then from there we also looked at another way of storing information in terms of scripts and schemas. And so, uh, this uh, brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you.